thyroid gland. Uh, let's talk about this one. Um, first off, I want to go back and revisit this table. Uh, actually, let's talk about the location first. So you probably know where your thyroid gland is. Um, your larynx and your laryngeal cartilages are easy to feel right here. And then the thyroid is sort of butterfly shaped and right below and sort of wrapping around. Um, so it releases two hormones that we've mentioned before, and they are T3 and T4. And T3 and T4, you have to know the long names and the abbreviations, and there's even one more name for T4. T3, its long name, again, tells you a heck of a lot about it. Tri, as in three, iodo, iodines, thyro, where it's from, and it ends in I and E. So three iodines from the thyroid, and it's an amine, okay, T3. And then T4, um, tetraiodothyronine, four um, iodines from the thyroid and it's an amine. So T3 and T4. The other name for T4 very commonly used is thyroxine. It's not the name for T3. It's the name for T4. So what do these hormones do? And then we'll get back into talking about how they're regulated. Um, and we'll talk about some uh, disorders as well. So both of these hormones... Um, are going to be responsible for increasing the metabolic rate. Think of it as all of the, most of the um, chemical reactions in a biochemical pathway um, will go more quickly in the presence of T3 and T4 than without them. So they increase the metabolic rate. They're also really, really necessary for proper brain development and function. They affect almost every single tissue in the body, um, especially during growth. And um, the other thing that's true is if you do not have adequate levels of these, you will not make growth hormone. Because before you commit to growth, um, let's just say that you make a check in the bloodstream to see if you have adequate levels of these metabolic hormones before you commit to something extra like growth. Okay, so growth hormone um, requires adequate levels of T3 and T4. So um, the chemical class of hormones, these two are the lone lipid soluble amines that you learn, and that's what goes in the chemical class column. And iodine is, of course, required for the synthesis of both of these hormones. Um, so let's talk about um, clinical connections with these, and then we'll draw a feedback loop with them as well. So um, if you think about it, you could probably kind of figure out what kind of big symptoms would go along with too much or too little um, of these during adulthood. So we'll talk about those two in just a second. But I do want to tell you that something that's really important is that um, if you have hypothyroidism, hyposecretion of T3 and T4 during fetal development and it's untreated, and this is totally treatable, um, then it will cause a disorder called congenital hypothyroidism, which they used to call cretinism. Don't call it that anymore, but still, if you were looking for historical images, that's what it would have been called. And um, since brain development requires boatloads of T3 and T4, if you do not have them, then the brain does not develop properly and you don't grow properly because you're not making adequate levels of, um, of growth hormone. So what happens is these um, children are born with severe, severe developmental di disabilities that are, mm, uh, that are permanent. Um, they are also short stature, very small, and for some reason, because of the metabolic hormones, it tends to cause more growth of soft tissues than hard tissues. So they will have like a protruding abdomen. It looks like ascites, and they also have a protruding tongue. And um, if it's super duper severe, a lot of times they won't live past infancy. If it's less severe, then they may actually survive past infancy, and sometimes they're institutionalized for their entire lives. But... I want to revisit because those of us who could become pregnant, if you are getting adequate medical care during a pregnancy and they notice that you're low in thyroid hormone, they will treat you with thyroid hormone throughout your pregnancy to make sure that this not, does not occur. Okay. So um, if you have adequate medical care, most women, even most women with hypothyroidism can have a perfectly healthy pregnancy with medical care. Okay. So now let's talk about 
hypothyroidism during adulthood. So if your brain was already developed and then you developed hypothyroidism, let's talk about what kinds of symptoms you might expect. So hypothyroidism during adulthood can lead to a suite of symptoms um, called Hashimoto's disease. Now, don't let this confuse you. Not everyone who has hypothyroid has Hashimoto's, but everyone who has Hashimoto's has hypothyroid. Um, now, what it is, is there's like 20 different symptoms that could be associated with hypothyroidism. And if you have X number of them and the X changes from year to year, then you will be diagnosed with Hashimoto's. So sometimes you can just start out hypothyroid and then you'll end up with Hashimoto's. But Hashimoto's is basically this big suite of symptoms in which you've got a lot of the um, symptoms associated with hypothyroidism. So let's look at what could happen with this. So hypothyroidism during adulthood um, is usually autoimmune. Usually your immune system makes a mistake and starts to attack your thyroid and then your level of T3 and T4 will drop. And when that occurs, not surprisingly, you're going to be tired because of the drop in metabolism. You're also often going to start gaining weight, okay? Probably doesn't surprise you. And then there's all kinds of like secondary symptoms that can occur like constipation and reproductive um, abnormalities. Um, in addition, a lot of times associated with hypothyroidism, you will have the development of what is called a goiter because your um, thyroid is under secreting and you will try to increase the size of it, cell division, to compensate for that. And so a lot of times goiters are relatively small and it just looks sort of like your neck is chubby, but these are some major goiters. Here's a small one, but this isn't hypothyroidism. She's actually got the other one. So you can see a little bit of a goiter right there. Okay, so associated with um, Hashimoto's, often there's a goiter. So now let's talk about the other one and then we'll talk about the symptoms that are associated with both of them. So Graves' disease is really the opposite. It's when, as an adult, you have a hyper secretion of T3 and T4 and same kind of thing. Not everyone who is hyperthyroid has Graves, but everyone who has Graves is hyperthyroid. So if you have X amount of the possible symptoms of hyperthyroid, then you can be diagnosed with Graves' disease. And Graves' disease is like way, way too much, um, too much uh, T3 and T4. So imagine that you'd get a lot of weight loss, um, nervousness, and sleeplessness is one of the problems. Um, emotional instability, you have a lot of trouble with thermoregulating. Um, with Graves, you're more likely to get too hot and not be able to cool down because your metabolism is really high. And with Hashimoto's, you're more likely to be too cold and can't warm up because your metabolism is too low. And Graves often has a goiter as well. Um, and this time, the goiter is more causing the problem than responding to the problem. Because sometimes, like if I had a benign tumor um, on my thyroid gland, those excess cells could be secreting too much T3 and T4, and that will actually cause a goiter as well. So, um, and then the other thing associated with Graves is something called exophthalmos, which is for some reason, I don't even understand why, I don't know if it's understood, you start, start to develop excess fat pads, even though you're really losing fat almost everywhere else, you develop excess pat, fat pads in the orbital fat behind your eyes, and it progresses protrudes your eyes. So you, you can see with this woman right here, do you see how her eyes look a little big? That's not super dramatic in her. And she's got a goiter. So this would be more indicative of Graves' disease than, for instance, Hashimoto's. And then here's a woman pre and post treatment. So she had this exophthalmos. And then this is actually a surgical treatment in which they like, okay, we're going to go in and we're going to tighten up the ligaments um, and um, remove some of the fat behind the eye. Here is a super duper dramatic exophthalmos. It can get so dramatic that you can't close your eyes. So that's exophthalmos. Um, and so a lot of these goiters that you're seeing, um, they could theoretically be either um, hyposecretion of thyroid or hypersecretion of thyroid. With a goiter that's this size, usually what's happening is 
if you um, have some areas of the world that are super high elevation with lots of rain melt and runoff or snow melt and runoff, um, then uh, iodine, which is water soluble, gets carried from the top down to the bottom. And the people, for instance, living at the top of a mountain range, I'm going to say Andes, but I'm terrible at geography, so I just made that up. Um, they might have such low iodine in their water sources that they start developing um, goiters because of um, the lack of iodine. So these are hypothyroid goiters, and those are treatable with adding iodine back. Okay, so, and then heat and cold intolerance can be associated with um, each of those um, uh, thyroid disorders. Okay, so now what we have to do is for the first time, we have to revisit this and put together a whole feedback loop, okay? And what we're going to do is we're going to build this feedback loop right here, and we're going to put it right here. So we're going to draw the feedback loop for T3 and T4 secretion. By the way, your textbook goes into some detail about this. I don't care that you learn the actual um, mechanism, but T3, T4 is actually generally converted into T3. Don't care, won't even hold you responsible for that. So I'm going to de develop a simpler one than this. So let's look at learning our first complete feedback loop um, that we can draw here. So it says draw the feedback loop for T3 and T4 secretion. So let's do it together. Okay, here we go. Okay, so if you are talking about um, thyroid hormone regulation, T3 and T4, what organ do you start with? So what is the start for T3 and T4? Look in that purple box. Okay, so the organ that starts the whole thing is, of course, the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus is really involved in a lot of this stuff. Hold on, I'm having trouble here. Oh, sorry, this pad is... Okay. Okay, and the hypothalamus releases what relevant hormone to this story? it releases TRH, okay? And then TRH goes where? Look at the orange or uh, peach box. TRH goes where all hypothalamus hormones go, which is the anterior pituitary, good. And then the anterior pituitary releases what hormone in response to TRH? TSH thyroid stimulating hormone, the other name is thyrotropin, and then that one goes where? It goes to the thyroid, and then the thyroid in response secretes T3 and T4. Okay, so the thing that we haven't done yet is to look at the feedback mechanism to make sure that in a healthy person you do not have too much or too little T3 and T4 circulating. And it's actually more T3 than T4, but we won't worry about that. We're just going to lump them together. So how do you make sure that you don't have too much of each circulating? You have a feedback loop that will allow your T3 and T4 to stay relatively regular because what T3 and T4 does is it feeds back negative feedback inhibition. Because it is lipid soluble, it can feed back to the hypothalamus. If it were not lipid soluble, it could not get through the blood brain barrier to feed back to the hypothalamus. So it will feed back to the hypothalamus, negative feedback to stop the secretion of TRH. But then to make this even more responsive, it can also feed back to the anterior pituitary and simultaneously stop the secretion of TSH. Okay, so this is the feedback mechanism for T3 and T4. Now, T3 and T4 are super duper important and it's really easy to write test questions about them. So make sure that you super well, you know them super well. So the feedback loop for T3 and T4, um, and then I ask you a question right here. What is the feedback mechanism for TRH, T TSH, T3, and T4? That is our first great, super good example um, actually, not our first, but a great example of what we would call hormonal feedback. So this is hormonal feedback. That's what that is. Okay, so that's the feedback mechanism for TRH, TSH, T3, and T4. Now, even though we've got one more hormone that comes from the thyroid, 
I'm going to do it in a separate video because I don't want you to think that this other thyroid hormone has anything to do this with this regulatory mechanism that I just talked about. So this regulatory mechanism right here is not going to be related to the next hormone that we do, which also comes from the thyroid. Okay, so we'll stop there and then I will do the other thyroid hormone. Escape. Okay.